Okay, thank you very much, everybody. We're sorry that uh, we're running a little bit late. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, Diversity in STEM session, and uh, I want to introduce you to these uh, four incredible people that we have here today. So, um, joining us from Grand Canyon, Chris? <laughs> Can you hear us? Great, thank you, Chris. So this is Dr. Chris Atchison. Uh, Chris uh, earned his PhD in science education from Ohio State University. He's an assistant professor of geoscience education at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, and his research focuses on enhancing access and inclusion in the earth sciences through experiential learning opportunities for students with sensory and orthopedic disabilities. He is the founder and executive director of the International Association for Geoscience Diversity, which is an organization charged with advocating for students and geosciences with disabilities while identifying and developing current instructional opportunities and resources that promote full access and inclusion in the geosciences. So Chris is joining us from, from the Grand Canyon right now where he is busy working on an NSF uh, proposal or an NSF uh, project to try and increase access on field campaigns, I believe. Thanks, Chris. Um, we also have uh, Dimitri uh, Dunas Fraser. Uh, he's a research associate in physics education research group at the University of Colorado Boulder. So he is a postdoc like you all. Um, he earned his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 2012 uh, in high precision measurements of atomic parity violation in Iterbium. Is that correct? Good grief. <laughs> While also playing a leadership role in the diversity oriented Berkeley Compass, Compass Project. His research focuses on studying and improving upper division physics lab courses and increasing diversity in the sciences by supporting the persistence of students from underrepresented groups. Um, we have Michael Williams. Uh, Michael Williams is uh, faculty in the School of Public Affairs at Baruch College uh, in SUNY. Primarily a quantitative researcher, his interests focus on equity and diversity, the social psychological development of students, and institutional diversity sorry, in America's uh, uh, higher education. He earned his master's degree in higher education from the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD in higher education and student affairs from Ohio State. Uh, and finally, but not, uh, certainly not least, we have uh, Sandra Larson. Um, Sandra is a senior research associate and co-director of Ethnography and Evaluation Research, where she leads research and evaluation studies focused on education and career paths in STEM fields. Her research interests include the underrepresentation of women and people of color in the sciences and organizational change in higher education. She's also interested in inquiry-based teaching and learning and the challenges of improving STEM education in and out of the classroom and across organizations. Her PhD is in chemistry from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, and previously she's taught chemistry uh, in Michigan and uh, conducted atmospheric science research at NOAA here in Boulder. Um, she's a faculty associate at CU Center for the American West. So I want to thank you all very much indeed for being here. We really, really appreciate your time. Um, Sandra, I'm going to ask you to, to, to set us up and go first. So everybody is going to be giving a short 10-minute presentation um, to give you a bit of information about data, about diversity in, in the sciences, um, uh, and then we'll uh, switch into a Q&A session so we can uh, get your questions. Let me say just as we start, um, while well, it's getting teed up, uh, that what I'll be talking about today, uh, this is a very quick summary of research. I'm a researcher in this area, and this is what I'll be talking about. So everything I say comes from research, but I won't give you all of the evidence I have for some of these claims because we don't have time for that. But I wanted to start with some of the numbers uh, for women in particular, sort of the largest of the different underrepresented groups we're going to talk about today, um, and just show you some data. These are uh, sort of some nice summary charts from a recent National Geographic article, um, just on the, the pace of women's incorporation into the STEM workforce. So 1970, about 7% of the workforce was women. Uh, tw 20 years later, that had increased to 23%. Uh, 20 years after that, in 2011, it's still only 26%. So slow pace of change to uh, come up to what we would call representative of the population. And I'll use that term under-representation by comparison with the whole U.S. population, which is about 51% women. Um, we're, we're rather behind on the numbers of women. <clears throat> Uh, working women working in STEM occupations, this is uh, the same data sliced up by different disciplines. And what you see is that the pace of change has been, or the change has been upward over the same period of time, these 40 years uh, in this data set, but that you can see that it has been rather different in different fields. So for instance, for engineering, we're still only at 13% of the engineering workforce is women. Um, again, a different pace of change. 
And finally, this is just looking at the doctorate, uh, doctorates awarded by gender. Again, the point here is uh, different in different disciplines, right? And so uh, the pace of change, uh, part of the, what the research shows, the pace of change has been slow and it varies by field. So that tells us that there are some interesting disciplinary issues going on. I also want to just mention, you're going to see a mix of things. I've taken some of these graphs from a variety of sources. Um, the term I'll be using is gender, and that's how we socially present ourselves as women or men, or um, as we're increasingly coming to understand uh, things in between, or, or uh, genders, um, the gender is not just a binary definition. Um, that's different than sex, the biological sex we're born with, and so I will stick with the terms gender and talking about women and men as the way we present ourselves by gender. We usually in education or workforce data do not know about biological sex, that's not what we ask. Um, that would be more appropriate in biology studies or medicine or so on. Um, and I'll also just say that this word underrepresented, to use that word um, relative to some base uh, number of populations, such as the percentage of women in the entire US population, we have to know what that representation is. And as I think you'll hear from some of my colleagues to later, that in some cases for women, we can measure that pretty accurately. Um, for other kinds of uh, diversity, we don't know what the the, the right representation should be, what, the, um, what we're comparing to. And so we, we can't always use that term accurately, although we can, we can surmise that some groups will be underrepresented. The other term, term I want to just bring up and put into your thoughts is the term of intersectionality. This is the idea that um, when we talk about women, we're talking about a very diverse group still, right? Women in STEM, still a very diverse group. There are women of color, there are women with disabilities, there are women who were born overseas, who were born in the US, who have different all kinds of variation. And so when we talk about identity and, and women's experiences in the sciences, uh, we need to remember that not every woman is the same as every other woman, and not every man is the same as every other man, that we all have multiple identities, and that when more than one of these identities are marginalized um, or underrepresented, we may have particular issues. Women of color may have different issues uh, for working in science than white women. And so it's just a, a, a term to be aware of and to recognize that um, not everybody's the same. And finally, I'll mention that when we look at statistics and numbers, we can look at some of these numbers and say, gee, engineering has some issues um, uh, in hanging on to women or attracting women. Um, and so they can tell us there's a problem. But when we get up to something that is representative, for instance, 47% of the mathematics workforce is women, um, that doesn't tell us that we don't have a problem, right? It tells us we're doing better on representation, but it doesn't tell us about the experience that people have in those fields. Um, and so don't, don't take numbers uh, solving the numbers problem to, to mean that the whole issue is solved. Um, just some numbers for geoscience in particular. This is a, a different way of displaying it. The um, blue curve of bachelor's degrees earned over time since 1974 up till recent times is time shifted by seven years so that you can see that the number of PhDs given to women is, or the percentage of PhDs given to women is tracking undergraduate representation pretty well if you sort of allow for the time lag of finishing a bachelor's and then deciding to go to graduate school and get a PhD. Um, if you look at the orange dots, those are postdocs, those are you folks. Um, good representation, but you can see it's lower, right? Not all PhDs go on to do a postdoc. The number of faculty, the green triangles, those are assistant professors, and so on, on down to the um, blue squares. So what you can see there is that um, there is a time lag for people to get degrees and then go on to become professors. Not everyone does that, of course, um, but that the percentage of, of women on the professoriate in geoscience it's still well below the numbers of people that are coming through with these degrees now. Partly due to time lag and partly due to other issues in people's choices and opportunities and um, access to those careers. Um, so the numbers, um, again, help to tell a story, but don't tell us what the story's all about. Finally, let me make one more point. This is data from chemistry, not from geoscience, but it's a study we did where we looked at 50 top departments um, in how, they, how many women PhDs they produced um, graduating with PhD. And these are just, I'm just showing you the average for the whole group and then two, two departments that I've called out as outliers. Um, we studied 50, it's not that we just studied two. But what I want to point out here is that the average is, you know, a nice slope, steady growth in the number of women getting PhDs in chemistry can hide a lot of variability. In this case, you can see one department, the blue line, um, started near the national average uh, 25 years ago and did some things in their department to make a difference and to really um, 
um, support and recruit, recruit and support women, um, and now are one of the excellent national leaders with you know, nearly half of their students graduating are women. Um, contrast that with another department that was below average when they started and are even more below average now. That's a department where something else must be going on in terms of their ability to attract and retain women. And so I just want to point out that local environments do matter and that these national averages um, can hide a lot of interesting learning about what environments are supportive for women <coughs> and other groups. Okay, I just want to contrast this briefly with uh, why is science different? Why is this a problem? And what I want to show you here, these are data on um, the numbers of women in law and medicine. And what you see, and this, these are the same time frame as the data I showed before, where we had a slow growth in the percentage of women getting, these, getting degrees, advanced degrees um, in science, and then uh, continued slow growth. And what you see here is that in the 70s, when law schools and medical schools started to take seriously the admission of women, um, took down barriers to that, the women's movement, civil rights movement, uh, were making noise about these things, the number of women entering law school and medical school shot up very quickly, right? There's a very steep growth in the 70s, and it continues to grow. And both of those fields are fairly close to parity at this point in time. So what that tells us is it's not that women are avoiding hard fields or demanding fields or aren't smart enough to do it, right? It tells us that maybe science, there's something different about science um, in the scientific fields in that engineering can be growing so slowly over time when something like law and medicine um, changed very rapidly. Um, again, law and medicine still have the same problem of time lag, right? That doctors and lawyers graduating 40 years ago, who are now in their 60s um, <coughs> or 70s, um, are still mostly male. But you can see from this graph, this is a graph of the percentage of women versus age of the medical and law practicing doctors and practicing lawyers. And so there's that same time lag, but it's, but it's clear that over time, the workforce in these fields will have uh, large fractions of women. Um, just so you th don't think medicine and law have all the problems solved, I just want to point out a recent study of department chairs at top 50 medical schools. And when they looked at the percentage of the chairs who were women, even though the percentage of women graduating with medical degrees is half, uh, the number who are advancing into the top academic positions is still small. Right? So only 13% of the leaders in these top schools are women. And this was kind of a fun study because they compared that to the fraction of leaders who had mustaches. <laughs> right? More of the leaders in these academic departments had mustaches than were women. Um, and it was a kind of tongue-in-cheek study, although it's done rigorously. And they have a nice diagram in there that shows all the kinds of mustaches they included in their count of mustaches. Um, <laughs> not any old facial hair, not just beards. Had to be on the top lip. <laughs> and so the point is right, that, that um, there, are, there are things about uh, women's characteristics um, that make them able and successful in getting advanced degrees, but not in advancing into leadership, even in these fields. And so what that brings up is the notion of implicit bias. Um, the idea of implicit bias, it's a well-researched subject at this point. The social psychologists um, have documented this over and over again. Our minds are good at finding patterns, right? And as scientists, we're really good at finding patterns. That's what we do for a living. These are mental schemas. They're, they're quick ways of noticing patterns and organizing knowledge into patterns. They're very robust. They're very persuasive. Uh, they're very pervasive. We do it all the time. And we don't always know we're doing it. And so these patterns might be true in general. But the problem comes when we start applying that to individuals. And we start making judgments about individuals or making decisions, applying our general scheme to an individual, right? And so, you know, women are mothers. Well, that's true. Biology says that only women can be mothers um, and that women in our society still do more of the parenting. But then if we start explaining a particular woman's behavior because she's a mother or a parent or because she's not, that's where we get into trouble, right? And so these are habits of mind that we have. And so that's why they're called implicit, right? We don't always notice we're doing it. Um, so it's psychologically advantageous. Evolution probably helped us develop this, right? It's good to notice that the saber-toothed tigers are out at night and we should stay in our caves and, and uh, you know, be safe. Um, and so it's a useful ability to find patterns, but it's, it can be pernicious. Um, and what I want to point out is that because they're patterns and habits of mind, we can train ourselves um, not to do them. They don't have to predict our behavior. Let me just say a little bit about uh, implicit bias or unintended bias. Um, this is, I think, a, a particular problem within science because we think of ourselves as objective. We think of ourselves as fair and impartial. We, we think we're able to make judgments based on data and not let our personal 
um, habits or preferences come in. We also want to believe deeply in the meritocracy. We want to believe we've gotten where we've gotten because we deserve to, that it's merit-based. We don't want to think that we're applying unfair criteria um, when we make judgments about people's advancement. Um, we also have counterexamples, right? We can all point to a superb, talented person who's the leader, who's the department chair, who's the dean, who's the president, um, and we use that to say, well, if, it, if we can have a black president, then it must be fair to black people in America, right? And the counter, it's the counterexample um, does not prove the rule, and in fact, it sort of shows us that, that we know better <laughs> than the rule, okay? So uh, unintended biases are tricky to spot. Um, but they can be spotted. Um, we are most likely to apply them when we're under time constraints in making judgments. We're trying to make a quick judgment. When the task involves ambiguity, we're trying to make a holistic decision about which student should get the scholarship or who should get the job instead of having clear criteria that we can rate people. Um, and when we're doing sort of automated processing and we're not having to say, why am I putting this person in the yes pile and this person in the no pile? So those are the places where we're most likely to have these implicit biases. And again, the research is very robust. We all have them. We have them about our own groups, right? Women have implicit bias against women um, in certain kinds of roles. We, we are less likely to associate women with leadership. That's where those medical school data on women and mustaches come from, right? In part is because we don't think of women as leaders. We don't, our, our mental image of a leader is different from our mental image of a woman. And I think that comes into play when we are talking about things like scientist or engineer. If we think about the characteristics of an engineer, we think analytical, we we think precise, we think uh, whatever we think, you know, <laughs> and maybe that doesn't square with our gender schema or our stereotype of women as nurturing and caring and people oriented instead of data oriented, right? And we can all give examples that are counter to that, but our stereotypes um, are harder to reconcile when the idea of a woman and the idea of an engineer are different, so it's harder to think of a woman being a good engineer or a woman being a good leader or a man being a good nurse, right? So, th so these, these stereotypes um, get us into trouble um, when they're operating implicitly. Um, I just want to point out a cool tool for this. There's a, there's a test you can take online, the implicit bias test. Um, it uses images and it shows you quick images and you have to make decisions about those images quickly and your time response um, tells you when it's harder to make a decision that associates two ideas that don't reconcile as well in your head as two other ideas that do. Right? So it's based on uh, robust psychological testing. It's kind of fun. There's a whole bunch of them you can take. And the answers may surprise you. Right? We, we, we try to be um, non-biased. We think of ourselves as not being prejudiced. But the reality is we have a lot of prejudices and stereotypes because of the society we live in. Um, so, to sort of boil it down then, I've, I've talked a bit about uh, schemas or implicit bias. Implicit bias results from our gender schemas, not reconciling. And so that leads to us to um, evaluate people differently. Um, the same criteria can be read. And there's blind tests, lots of research that shows us the identical resume that has a man's name or a woman's name are read differently and evaluated differently. Um, the same thing if you use a, a, you know, a name that is stereotypically African-American versus a stereotypically you know, white, middle-class, European-American kind of name, sounding name. Um, we evaluate those differently, even in, in experimental tests when the actual information is identical. So that leads people to not have opportunities to be evaluated differently. And over time, those things add up. And this is the idea of accumulation of disadvantage, that small differences in how we get evaluated over and over and over again as students, as undergraduates, as graduates, as faculty, or in our jobs, um, over time, these accumulation, accumulated small differences in evaluation add up. Um, <clears throat> and again, because of this meritocratic culture of science, we don't want to believe that's true, and it's harder for us to spot when that might be happening. Lots of research on that area. Another area where there's good evidence about barriers for women in STEM are uh, policies, procedures, cultures that are based on male career patterns. A lot of this has to do with things like family policies and in institutions or workplaces um, and so on. Uh, finally, um, when that happens, um, the, um, when you live in that kind of environment for a long time as a woman, uh, this actually takes a toll on your confidence, right? So there are also barriers for women internally, the psychology of this, handling this, this sort of the thousand paper cuts day to day, these small micro inequities that add up over time. It can be self-doubt, right? Loss of confidence. And the idea of imposter syndrome um, is one where we feel like we've gotten somewhere and, and nobody knows that we actually are 
um, you know, incompetent, right? <laughs> no, we, somebody will find out that I don't really know all the calculus I learned when I was a freshman, right? And then also the idea of stereotype threat, where there's actually research that demonstrates that if you remind someone that they belong to a group where we have stereotypes, common cultural stereotypes about the performance of that group, so you remind women just before they take a math test that, well, you know, women aren't as good as math. And you can do it very subtly. You don't have to do it that blatantly, right? Just remind them that they're women and remind them that this math test tests math ability. And they will unconsciously make that connection in their mind if they're familiar with that stereotype. And it will actually affect their performance, right? So then we get this spiral, right, where, where the, the, the loss of confidence and the self-doubt in that occasion actually goes to reduce performance, which means then the opportunity or the award or the score um, are not as in reach as they were. All right, so the point is that if we don't actively intervene with these um, features, the cycle reproduces itself, right? We have these gender schemas which cause us to unfairly judge people sometimes. Um, also, if we have few people in the category, if the people are underrepresented, right, and there's a small number of people, we're more likely to apply. It's less appropriate to apply the general pattern but it's also more inappropriate when we do, right? So we have a small number of people, and so we, we have a, critical, a lack of critical mass. And so we explain that one woman's behavior in our department by generalizing about all women. Then that leads us to this evaluation bias, right? Then we're underestimating someone's performance consistently over time, the disadvantages accumulates, the success rate becomes lower, right? So that person does not achieve as much because we've had this pile on of barriers, and therefore that reinforces our schemas that that group is not as successful, and that reinforces the low numbers, right? So it's a vicious cycle, these things. All right, so there's an inertia in the system which makes it hard to change, and I think that's part of the explanation for those slow, slow slopes um, that we saw in the earlier data. So just to finish up here, um, some things you can think about to do. One is educate yourself about these issues. Uh, recognize that there's an uneven playing field. Um, and I'm talking here about women. I think you're going to hear about the same kinds of issues with, with different nuances for other groups. Um, women are the largest of, of these underrepresented groups in science. And so I think much of what we learn from the research about women can be applied to other groups. Um, but also we have to be careful in doing so. But know about the uneven playing field. Uh, don't let people talk about that lowering standards, right? Diversity is equal to excellence. If you haven't tapped all of the pool and you don't have a diverse group of people in your applicant pool, your scholarship pool, your student body, then you're not getting all the talent that's out there. Um, and do things to improve the environment. As I showed in that one slide, right, different local environments do matter and there can be different successes um, in supporting people locally. So you can do things um, to help improve the environment for students and colleagues of all groups. Uh, for the young women in the room, the biggest thing you can do is to be ready for this. Know about these issues, be able to recognize them. Be ready in both senses, psychologically ready, support each other, right? Have that group of girlfriends that you just, you know, debrief about stuff. Um, but also be ready in your work. Do excellent work so that you're not, um, you're doing your best in these circumstances, right? Put on your Superman cape and stand in front of the fan. <clears throat> and finally, you all may not think of yourselves as leaders yet, but some of you um, are becoming leaders and you will be leaders and you can start to be leaders as soon as you um, are in any scientific environment. You have already achieved a lot, right? You've achieved advanced degrees and, and you're shooting for other positions and other opportunities. And so be an example and put pressure on other people. Um, if you find yourself in a leadership role, head of a search committee or head of a department someday, um, you can do things like be sure that your colleagues get training on things like implicit bias. Um, and you can um, accept accountability for these things and assign it. Your opportunities to do that will be greater in, in the future when you're in leadership, formal leadership roles. But you can start doing that now. And I just want to mention finally uh, a, a resource that is focused on this more institutional level resources, policies and procedures and things. This is a research-based resource that I and my colleagues have built um, called the Strategic Toolkit. And a lot of the things in there are not uh, quite at your pay grade yet, but there are um, ideas for what institutions can do. And so if you get to the place where you'd like to know what can institutions do about dual career hiring or family leave policies or faculty development, um, this is a good resource for those kind of institutional strategies. All right, turn it over to the next. Thank you. <laughs> Michael. Oh, 
Um, just again, my name is Michael Stephen Williams. I'm an assistant professor at Brew College, the City University in New York. Um, our topics and our conversations are so like deeply connected that I don't even feel the need to like slide through my slides anymore. Um, <laughs> um, but what what I, I do want to do is kind of add a little bit of nuance and like help us think a little bit differently. Um, so every time I have an opportunity to speak to a group, um, I do the normal preparation that you're all familiar with at this point. You know, go back through the major statistics, like kind of look at the stuff that I think is important, look at the things that um, I don't think are so important. Um, and looking at this group, having an opportunity to kind of pop in and see who is here, um, you know, personally see like there's a single other black face here. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I, I mulled over and like kind of went back and forth a lot about like what I wanted to share. Um, and so I, I want to play with and kind of think about a couple of ideas and then I'll back it up with some of the data that um, jumped out at me as I was thinking about preparing this time. Um, and really I, I want to start by building on the idea of structural diversity. You know, so this idea that if we get to this critical mass, even the, the word critical mass suggests something like, oh. Like if there are just enough of us, like suddenly things are gonna magically change. Um, mm, that's not true, it's not true anywhere. Um, it's not true for women, it's not true for people of color, it's not true for whites. Um, there are three forms of diversity that kind of dominate the conversation generally. So um, if you remember, if you've ever heard of like higher education research and the big affirmative action cases that went on at the University of Michigan, um, Patricia Gurn, who's a researcher from the University of California, Los Angeles, um, and probably one of the foremost voices, um, emerita professor that deals with diversity, um, she kind of separates diversity into three distinct groups. Um, so there's structural diversity, the one that we're probably most familiar with, um, the one that actually a lot of the slides that were shown before and some of the slides that I'm gonna show um, tend to deal with, you know, what's the count, what's the percentage, you know, how many people are here, um, how does that relate to the, the larger population. Um, but probably more important, uh, particularly for those of you who are moving into um, fields where you're gonna be working with, where you're gonna be mentoring students, um, where you're gonna be dealing across difference, whether it's with your coworkers or with the students that aspire to be like you, um, are the other two forms of diversity that they outlined, and that's interactional diversity and classroom diversity. Uh, so classroom diversity is a little bit easier, and it, it's really about, okay, what, what's happening in the classroom environment? What's going on that creates opportunities for people to draw on the diversity that's in the room? You know, so if magically, you know, people are of difference in these rooms, um, what are the professors doing? What are the instructors doing? What are the graduate students who are working with the students doing to ensure that the diversity of thought, that the diversity of experience is actually coming out in the classroom and it's enhancing and otherwise um, creating a better experience for people. Um, and then that's related to interactional diversity. There's interactional diversity within the classroom, but interactional diversity outside of the classroom is probably just as important, if not more important. Um, those co-curricular interactions, you know, the things that make people feel like, I belong on this campus. You know, I'm a member of this community. Um, whether it's, uh, there's a strange breakdown of, on the panel. It's like two UC Berkeley and two Ohio State. Um, <laughs> you gotta give a go bucks to my homie who's not up there right now. Um, you know, well, what's happening outside of the classroom? You know, are, are people talking to each other across difference if they're not working on a project together? Um, do people who carry identities or a social address that isn't normal, quote unquote, or normative for that campus, do they feel comfortable navigating the various spaces that are available on campus? Are they taking advantage of academic support services? Um, are they willing to ask for help because of fear, the stereotype that was, uh, that was mentioned before, that maybe they're confirming, um, in some cases, a negative stereotype about them? Um, or, in some cases, they're disconfirming a positive stereotype. You know, some of the, the most interesting work that I've done recently um, has been a transition to some qualitative data collections where working with students who actually have to overcome the problems associated with being in a group that's positively stereotyped. You know, an Asian American student who can't do math. Um, what, what does this look like? Am I a disappointment to my family? What if somebody like sees me going into the academic support services? Have I shifted this? Have I somehow let down my race um, and created a narrative that isn't aligned not only with like what other people view, um, but also with how I view myself. Um, you know, retention and persistence in science and engineering, particularly the hard sciences, um, a lot of the, the more interesting work, at least the work that, you know, I spend a lot of my time with, um, is about have you developed a science identity? Um, how can you be resilient in the face of failure? You know, do you still want to be a doctor after you take organic chemistry? 
um, you know, helping people get over these hurdles and think differently about um, the way that they interact, but also what, what diversity means um, is beyond just kind of these broad generalizations and these separations into underrepresented minority and like well-represented minority. Um, and so the, these are words that I constantly come across, you know, that are kind of the the coin of the realm, if you will, um, particularly in science and engineering. And so like, I, I can tell you right now that the slides that I'm about to share are from the NSF. And so the NSF has probably the best and most comprehensive data collection about science and engineering students, but they drive the conversation because they choose to collect data in certain categories and they choose to report that data using certain coded words. So an underrepresented minority is somebody who is black, of Latino heritage or Native American. Um, a, a not underrepresented minority is an Asian American. Um, and so like these buckets, these kind of categories that we create, um, the schema that we're forced to kind of deal with, it ends up changing the conversation and stopping us from thinking critically about other groups and other people that need help. You know, um, our unwillingness in some cases, um, or our inability to disaggregate in meaningful ways um, what the data is telling us about student success. You know, so referring back to the Asian American students just because it's fresh in my mind because I'm doing a lot of work with it right now. Um, if you disaggregate Asian American students by ethnic groups, you know, Laotian, Hmong, um, they're not doing as well as Chinese, Japanese. Um, and so some of the questions that we need to ask are about not only what's going on with this group, this broad group, this broad group that has, a, I mean, really unlimited amount of diversity um, underneath it, um, but like how can we serve everybody? You know? um, science and engineering as a career, as a major field, um, there are declines in a lot of places. Um, you know, white students are declining. Um, as a share of the field completely. It's not just demographic shifts, it's people moving away from it. Um, and I think our, our willingness to ask new questions and different questions, to think about diversity as more than just whatever social labels are convenient, you know, man, woman, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Hispanic, non-white, um, is really what I, I want us to kind of think about and push on while we're here. Um, so. I kind of thought about what I wanted to share in uh, a couple of broad categories. Um, for those of you who like heard my bio, I'm a post-secondary education researcher, and so like what I generally care about is are people getting from high school to college? Are they getting into college and getting out of college? And then are they going on to graduate school and like earning lots of money? You know, so one of the most popular education statistics or like graphics you'll see um, is called education pays. It kind of gets splattered everywhere without proper attribution, but it shows the step ladder of like, if you go from earning a high school degree to earning a bachelor's degree, you're gonna make about a million more dollars over the course of your life. And then if you go from that to a master's degree, it's another million. And then there's like a little tiny bump for PhD. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then there's a big bump again for professional degrees, you know, so uh, law school, medical school, um, things of that nature. Um, and what that kind of speaks to generally um, is the interconnection and really education as a social sorting mechanism for our society. Um, we've been kind of fed this idea, um, one which, that's a, a tangent that I don't want to get into about the, the education bubble bursting. Um, but that we're in a meritocratic society and part of us being able to demonstrate that merit is that we have the appropriate credentials. Um, you know, you can't do that job unless you have a bachelor's degree. No, you cannot work here unless you have a PhD. Um, and our willingness to buy into that or not buy into that, um, I, I bought into it. <laughs> I was in school for a really long time, fighting dissertations and advisors and um, trying to convince my wife that I was going to graduate very quickly so that we could move. Um, and it, it's really about, okay, how do we get people from point A to point B? Point A being whatever background they come from, no matter where they start, to wherever their ambition wants to take them. You know? um, and to me, it's, it's really about that. <sighs> Helping people realize their ambition. If a bachelor's degree is great for you, I have a lot of rich friends who only have a bachelor's degree. They make more than I do, um, and they spent a lot less time in school, and they've been able to do what they want to do with their time a lot more. Being an assistant professor is not so awesome when you have to write when everybody else is hanging out because they're off work. Um, but, you know, so be it. Um, so here, this is just um, 
degrees earned by underrepresented minorities in science and engineering. Um, you know, you'll see there's a, a continued uptick in the soft sciences, quote unquote, um, you know, social sciences, so psychology, there's a large representation. Um, just to give you some context, the number one doctorate granting uh, field for African Americans across all of them is actually education. Um, and so there have been some interesting inroads um, as people focus on science education, for example. Um, but what you'll see, and particularly interesting for this group, is like physical sciences have remained like relatively flat you know, across time. Um, when considering the differences between men and women, um, what's happening across all underrepresented minority groups, um, and it's particularly pronounced in certain groups, so um, black and Latino are particularly disparate, is that women are outpacing men. Um, women are going to college. Um, they're more likely to go to college. They're more likely to enroll in four-year institutions as their first institution. Um, they're more likely to pursue graduate education. They're more likely to earn doctorates. Um, this is particularly pronounced in the black community as um, undergraduate women outnumber undergraduate black men two to one. You know, so over 66%. Um, in most cases, it fluctuates. You know, sometimes it's like 63, sometimes as high as like 68 of the undergraduate black population is women. Um, and so when you're working with these like relatively small uh, raw materials, it becomes particularly important to support um, you know, these groups as we start to intersect identities, as we start to think about you know, not just race, but like also race and gender. Um, this is an interesting one, and this is one of the ones that I, I wanted to talk about a little bit and make sure that we consume while we're here. Um, and it's science and engineering degrees earned by white women and men. Um, from 1993 to 2012. And you see it's a downward trend pretty much across the board, um, if not stagnant, you know, like generally leveled off. And so some of the issues that we're facing aren't necessarily about, you know, we, we have these mandates and so if you're a grant writer and you want money from the NSF, you know, you know the code words, broadening participation of women and minorities in science and engineering. Um, but that ig ignores the fact that, hey, this is becoming less attractive in some ways. You know, this isn't just because of demographic shifts. It's not solely the fact that, you know, minorities are better represented. Other people are leaving the field, you know? White people are like, yeah, well, I'm good on organic chemistry. You know, I mean, material science, field work, no, no, no. Business, um, psychology. And so there, I, I bring this one up particularly because I think there, we all have to think critically about what the next generation of us looks like, you know, no matter what your field is. You know, are you doing what you need to do in your interactions? Are you making this attractive? Are you suggesting to people that this is a viable career? You know, are you sharing your zeal and your passion? You know, whatever animated you, whatever helped you to get through the slog that is getting to a PhD. Even if you had amazing advisors, um, you know, we've all, well, I'll speak for myself. Some of you are probably superheroes who like never doubted yourself and were like, oh, my dissertation was easy. <laughs> I wrote that in 10 minutes. Um, but look, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, like, what are we doing? What are we sharing about our stories um, to encourage, to push, um, to help the next generation think critically about being like we are, or pursuing the same type of fields that we are, overcoming the obstacles that we overcame. And then, two, what are we doing to remove those obstacles? Um, I throw this one up um, because, again, a lot of my work um, focuses on the intersection of race and gender. Um, and underrepresented minority women are one of the few groups that have had a, a pretty steady uptick in some of the things. But again, you'll see that there's a, a stark difference when you go from the more social science type of aspect to the harder science. Um, and so this is organized kind of in, there are a couple of different ways that people act, organize academic majors. Um, and so this is kind of organized from soft to hard, quote unquote, um, in terms of sciences. And you see, again, social sciences, psychology, you know, pretty steady uptick, a positive trend. Um, but some of the harder sciences, biological sciences, physical sciences, uh, mathematics and statistics, stagnant, or you know, in some cases, decreasing. Um, and then I, I wanted to, you know, because the outcome of education and like one of the hopes with education is that you, know, you invest this time and energy 
you participate in educationally purposeful activities, um, you're intentional about the time you spend on campus and the extracurriculars that you, you know, participate in. Well, a lot of that is related to this larger idea, which I'm sure all of you care about, which is employability. Um, and so, like, after you're done with that, after you've invested in college, after you've done all the work um, to earn your degree, you know, what happens? And so, um, science and engineering, uh, Kylie kind of alluded to this before, but the numbers are still pretty abysmal in terms of the way the, the workforce is made up, you know. So, over 70% white, 51% white men, 20% uh, white women. If you combine every single um, minority woman group, um, you arrive at about 15%. Um, and so, this sends larger symbolic signals to people. You know, if you go and you interview and you walk around a lab um, or you're at a corporation and you're looking for points of commonality or symbols that suggest that you belong there, you know, a lot of times those symbols in terms of like the physical manifestations of people, you know, simply aren't there because they don't work there. You know, it could be that the discrimination or difficulty of you know, getting to the end of the pipeline, they've chosen a career that's outside of science and engineering, outside of their field. Um, you know, it could be any combination. I've heard, you know, anything from, why would I do this when they hate me? Um, you know, heartbreaking quotations from participants in research studies. Um, two, it wasn't fun anymore. Um, that ethos, those ideas, they reverberate. Um, and they impact the next generation. Another piece that I'm particularly interested in, particularly like because I'm a faculty member, um, and always looking for ways to engage in allied behavior as a faculty member, um, is underrepresentation of both women and minorities in the professoriate. Um, and that's a that's another issue that is kind of connected to a lot of the stuff that we'll be talking about, and hopefully that we'll engage with in the panel. Um, and so, even now, um, with women being 51% of the population, with women earning outpacing men and earning degrees at every level um, when aggregated. So bachelor's degree level, master's level, and PhD level. Um, women still <laughs> only make up less than a quarter of the full professors um, in the science and engineering fields. Less than a quarter. You know, that protection, that care, that um, suggestion that you deserve to be at the highest levels um, is not really being communicated. And even more scary um, is underrepresented minorities as a percentage of full-time full professors in science and engineering. Um, this room is a little flash indicator of what that looks like, um, but here's some statistics. You know, under, like under 5% in a lot of cases at Research One institutions, the institutions that have the capacity um, to win the grants, to do the cutting edge, bleeding edge research, to attract the best and the brightest students from all over the country. Um, and again, these abysmal representation numbers, um, they reverberate throughout the field. So uh, with that, I will jump out of here because I'm talking for too long. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. So we're going to switch over to Chris and have a chat with him. While we're doing that, it takes a, a couple of minutes to do that, but while we're doing that, I really want to make the point that um, when we see this underrepresentation um, of, uh, of people, uh, certain types of people in the sciences, a lot we know from the research that it really is about climate, about workplace climate, or has a huge amount to do with it. There's a fascinating study done in 1997 which looked at the reasons um, why um, people of color drop out, and what they found is that that um, persistence in STEM has virtually nothing to do with aptitude. It has everything to do with the ability to cope with the stressful social situations that happen in science. And I think that that's something that I really want to drive home to everybody, is that we can make science a better and, and happier place for everybody, and in doing so, we can really change these demographics. So keep thinking about that as we're hearing from Chris. You know, this is within our power to change. And these, these differences that we see in these, these representations of different groups right now is something that we can fix, but only by changing ourselves and only by changing our science um, to be warm welcome to other groups. So um, I want to pass over to Chris now. Hi, Chris. Um, and ask you to, uh, to talk about your field of research. 
through this panel, you know, we're, we're trying to provide this, this variety of perspective on diversity. Um, I think that I would argue with, uh, with Dr. Larson a little bit by saying that when, when she said that, that women uh, is the largest underrepresented group, um, I don't disagree with you. However, individuals with disabilities span all groups, um, whether it's race, gender, ethnicity, uh, sexual identity, anything, you're going to find uh, the, you're, you're going to find disability. And in fact, each one of us falls on a spectrum of ability. Uh, and as we get older, uh, we, come, we become more and more uh, unable to do common tasks. You know, yesterday I, I spent the entire day at the Grand Canyon. Today I was at uh, Meteor Impact Crater, the Beringer Impact Crater. And uh, both days I woke up sore. And you know, I, 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 I'm not old by any stretch, and I am in fairly decent shape. But you got to imagine the older you get, the harder to do things. It, the, the harder it becomes to do the things that we take for granted, um, and that spectrum of ability uh, changes for us each and every day. For those of you who are sitting in the audience wearing glasses, you know, would you be able to do a lot of the things that you're doing? Uh, without your glasses, and I would probably argue that you couldn't. Um, so, the things that I bring up is more or less, you know, you, you have people that always argue, um, why are you trying to accommodate the few? Why are you spending so much time to accommodate few people when you have a much larger uh, classroom of students that you need to spend that time on? And I think what I'm going to share with you now, uh, you'll start to see why. Uh, you know, data has been introduced uh, on, on, on both uh, women in science, uh, individuals of color in science. Uh, the data on individuals with disabilities in science is very unreliable. And a lot of that is because of uh, a couple of reasons. One. Uh, you've got compliance issues where there's certain things that you just can't ask and things that you can't collect and things that university data that universities have that they're really not able to share. That's one. Two, uh, mo the most of the, the population of individuals with disabilities do not self-disclose their disability. And this goes back to the themes of bias and stereotype threat and all of those things that individuals just once they break out of K-12, they don't want to self-disclose as being disabled any longer. They want to be normal, uh, whatever that means. What does normal mean? Uh, you know, if you if you think about that from the, the from the, the whole spectrum of ability, uh, what does normal look like? Um, I don't. I, I would argue that that you know I don't want to get all existential on you or anything, but I, I you know. What, what is reality? What is normal? So how do you collect data on, a, on an underrepresented population that chooses not to self-disclose their disability? Um, I think the most recent uh, data that was gathered on individuals in, in, the, in the geosciences uh, is, is now over 20 years old. So uh, this is definitely something that's lacking and something that needs to be improved upon. Uh, but, I, but I would argue that, that any time that we try to collect data on this population, it's gonna be uh, unreliable. So the, the thing that I do want to share um, is that data has been collected that suggests that if you're looking at your classroom and in your classroom population or in our population in, in the audience today, of those who have a disability of some kind, whether it's cognitive, whether it's sensory, and that would include hearing and, and vision, uh, whether it's uh, mobility disabilities, whether it's behavioral, whether it's emotional, any, any of that. Uh, of all individuals with a disability, only 25% of them are self-disclosing. So when I get back to the point I was trying to make that uh, when somebody comes to me and says, why are you spending so much time accommodating the few? And I can come back to them and say, how do you know what the few are when 75% are not self-disclosing? 
means that when I'm accommodating the few, I'm accommodating the many as well. Uh, and then they just usually turn around and walk away from me because they know I'm not gonna, they, they, they don't wanna argue um, at that point. Uh, but, but we have this issue of apparent versus not apparent disabilities. Uh, you can obviously tell somebody who's in a wheelchair, who uses a wheelchair. You can obviously tell at some times when somebody is, uh, has a visual disability if they're using a cane. Uh, I have a colleague that I, that I lead workshops with, um, that I give presentations with, that I do research with, who is, uh, who is blind um, and has the ability to look right at you when she's talking to you. You would never know it. So if she wanted to blend in, she blends in very, very well. So we have this, this, this notion of apparent versus not apparent, and we are completely surrounded by individuals who have not apparent disabilities. And it's not something that you just ask, it's just something that you understand that you've got to accommodate. And when you're developing something uh, through multiple means of representation, so if, if you're planning, so, so ideas in terms of how you would accommodate an individual with a disability uh, in your instruction, um, in your presentations, any of that, if you're able to provide the content through multiple means of representation, you're representing the material uh, through through different through through different representations. Um, you're going to start accommodating more individuals. So, for instance, I'm sitting here speaking to you all audibly. Uh, I would venture to guess that there's probably not somebody there that's transcribing my 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 conversation with you. But I would argue that if somebody were there and there were a screen right next to the screen with my big head on it transcribing my conversation with you 75 percent of you if not more would be reading the transcription and watch and, and listening at the same time uh, if you've ever watched a movie that has subtitles after you realize that there's subtitles and you're annoyed by those subtitles halfway through the movie, you probably realize that you're reading the subtitles as well, because it's a multiple mode of that representation. And it, it starts to accommodate more people than you realize. Um, so considering that when you are, are uh, when, you're, when you're designing your instruction, when you're designing uh, anything that you do in the classroom and anything that you do outside of the classroom, you need to provide that multiple representation. Uh, additionally, if you are you're trying to assess your students, assess their their knowledge, you've got to allow them multiple ways to express their knowledge to you as well. Uh, these are just two of the principles of universal design for learning. And if you're not familiar with UDL, I would encourage you to look that up because again, if you're designing your instruction through the principles of universal design for learning, you're accommodating the many and not the few. So uh, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. Um, but please, please do look that up. Um, the, the other thing that I, would, that I would impress upon each of you is that uh, whenever you are faced with an individual with a disability, and sometimes, you know, it's convenient for me because when I, de when I, when I de develop a project and I recruit individuals or students into my project, I'm able to learn about the student before we get before we do the project. So, for example, uh, two years ago, I led an accessible field trip in, Van in British Columbia, in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I recruited the individuals into it, uh, uh, paid for them to come. I I knew exactly what those individuals could and could not do. There were students, and there were geoscience faculty that we brought together. Uh, again, much like this inclusive community of learning that I'm, that I'm working on now for this Arizona trip. Um, I had the opportunity to get to know those individuals, get to know their needs, get to know their, their abilities uh, well before we actually went on that trip. The, and, and so therefore I was able to design the trip around their abilities. The problem that we have in, in the classroom is for the most part you won't know what students you have until the first day of class. Uh, I think that, you know, I'm not knocking on the, the offices of disability services or the offices of accessibility services or whatnot. Uh, they just, there's just not enough time 
where notice is given that you have a student coming to your class uh, that has specific needs and, and accommodation needs. Uh, that needs to improve. Um, so a lot of times you're scrambling to accommodate an individual in your class and if you don't already have experience doing so, um, you're going to you're going to you're going to scramble. You're going to try and find what you can, uh, and a lot of times it doesn't work out. Um, so I go back to the planning issue. If you're planning for for things through UDL, if you're planning for delivering the content through multiple modalities, if you're planning to assess and evaluate your students and allow them to to not just take a paper and pencil exam or any of that kind of uh, information uh, delivery or you know you're going to be able to you're going to be able to accommodate them uh, a little bit better than than, than nothing at all. Um, so my, my my point here is to focus on an individual's ability rather than their inabilities, um, and and create the create a climate where uh, ability is is um, is celebrated. That you create a climate where everyone is self advocating and advocating for each other. Uh, you've got to create a climate where it's okay to struggle. It's okay to have challenges. And it's even more okay to, to work as a community to overcome those challenges. And I think a lot of times that this, and this might be why individuals uh, choose, to, choose to not self-disclose a disability, uh, is because they're afraid of being judged. Uh, they're afraid of, of ridicule. They're afraid, especially in, in, in field-based learning environments, they're afraid of, of pulling the group behind. They're afraid of being considered as receiving preferential treatment. Um, but if you created this, this culture, uh, this accessible, this inclusive culture where individuals are relying on each other's abilities, their, each other's perspectives, uh, you're going to do away with a lot of that fear uh, pretty quickly. And I noticed that right away. Um, on the in the bank on that Vancouver trip that I, that I presented, um, you know, in, in, in your designs, focusing on academic rigor over physical rigor. Uh, for those of you who have been in any kind of field-based learning experiences, you will remember a lot of what sucked about it versus what you actually learned. I think back to um, my my field camp and. I can tell you 10 things about the heat and being stung by wasps and the rain and everything that didn't go so well versus I can tell you maybe half a dozen things or, or, or fewer about what the learning objectives were, what the learning outcomes were, and what I actually learned from it. That's a problem. We need to focus on the learning objectives and the expected outcomes, the anticipated learning outcomes. Um, we need to put the preference or we need to put the focus on that rather than uh, having this, this notion of, of having a physically rigorous ex outdoor learning experience. Um, and if any of you are interested in talking more about that, I can talk about that to I'm blue in the face, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that much more now. Um, and in and, and thinking also about these field-based learning approaches, um, Keep this in mind, and this isn't just for individuals with disabilities. This is for an, every individual from an underrepresented population, um, and I would even go so far as to say this is this this is uh, this is based on any individual. That what interested us, what made us interested in the science that we are in now, doesn't necessarily mean it's the same thing that would interest an, under, an individual from an underrepresented population. There's a great study that's coming out um, right now that talks about uh, individuals uh, from from different uh, racial backgrounds, different uh, ethnicity backgrounds, and it talks about what the science means to them and the importance of the science. And for a lot of individuals from from underrepresented backgrounds, especially racial backgrounds, that. Um, being outdoors and learning outdoors is not an interest. It's it's something that we promote. If, if you go to any geoscience or any field-based learning science website, the departmental websites, you're going to find that there are pictures up there 
of people outside learning and getting dirty and it's more of a rite of passage than it is an actual learning experience for some because you can always talk uh, to individuals say hey where'd you do your field camp they don't say hey what did you learn at field camp they just say where'd you do your field camp and you know yeah I did this and oh it was awful and this that and the other thing and I loved it but not everybody's going to be interested by that and so we continue to promote this traditional perspective of, of field-based learning that is not interesting to individuals from underrepresented populations so why are we doing it we're continuing to push them away um, through the way we promote our science uh, and, and the last thing that I that I would uh, just urge you to consider how you are um, how you individually are promoting access and inclusion how would you promote inclusion I would imagine that a lot of the things that that you're hearing uh, not just from me but in the panel itself uh, is, is quite new to you is quite uh, unique and novel uh, so I would encourage you to consider these things to continue to consider how you will promote an inclusive environment and continue to look for resources and, uh, and in my bio, you can, you can find a link to a resource that's focused on the geosciences. A lot of the resources that we present on that website are, are not specific to the geosciences, so I would encourage you to look that up. But consider that. And, and if you ever have questions, um, if you ever want to talk about how to, to accommodate somebody, and if it's last minute and you're panicking, uh, I'm, I'm more than willing to, to hear from you and to talk to you. and, and uh, and kind of walk you off the ledge in that. So uh, that's that's all that I'm gonna that I'm gonna present now. If if you have any other questions or comments, I can help. We'll talk at the end here. But please feel free to, to email me. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Actually, a researcher whose research focuses on, say, LGBT issues, whereas we have, say, experts here in issues of gender and race and uh, disability and accessibility. Uh, but I'm a gay scientist and I'm a postdoc, so you know, kind of <laughs> so I'm coming from that perspective. Uh, and I'm also I'm going to throw maybe some statistics at you, but. Um, just know that there's not actually a lot of statistical work out there, so we don't know about issues of representation in, say, specific subdisciplines like the geosciences or physics, which is my discipline, um, or other disciplines. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to start off with this idea. Um, I want to have some sort of technical understanding of, say, what gender is. And uh, I want to talk separately about uh, gender expression, gender identity, biological sex, and then so, sort of what's happening at the chromosomal level, because those can all be very different. Um, so I'm up here, right, I'm wearing pants and a button shirt and belt. I'm dressed in a pretty masculine way. I have a pretty masculine haircut and masculine uh, sort of facial hair. Uh, so that's my gender expression, right? I'm presenting as masculine. That's basically all the information you have about me. You don't know about how I identify, though, you know, I, like I identify as male um, or a man. Uh, and you definitely don't know what's going on underneath my clothes and what's happening in my body. And you certainly don't know what's happening at the chromosomal level. And I, I don't either. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, if we think about this sort of using a scientific lens, right, we have some four-dimensional vector space that can be used to describe gender, right? We have expression, and we have identity, and we have biological sex, and then we also have chromosomal sex. And so the gender binary really is the reduction of that four-dimensional vector space to just two points, right? Masculine, male, uh, man, XY. Feminine, woman, female, XX. But actually, it's a really rich space. And one of the reasons that I wanted to introduce this sort of technical way to start thinking about gender um, or in a more complex thing is because I also want to be talking about, say, 
the way that we use technical language to marginalize uh, gender and sexual minorities. And this is one way we can use technical language to better understand right, the whole complicated landscape of gender. Just real quick, some numbers now. Uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual people make up about 4% of uh, the US population. Um, I don't really know like how solid is that number. These are all estimates, right? Because not everybody's out, not everybody self-reports. Similar issues to what we just heard about with respect to uh, disability, um, people with disabilities. Uh, people who are not, have non-binary uh, uh, biological sex, so these are uh, people who broadly can be lumped into the group of intersex people, are about one to two percent of the US population. And just for reference, that's about the proportion of people with red hair in the United States, right? So it's, you know, when I found out the statistics, I was like, oh, this is a lot more common than I usually think about. And then you, uh, trans people make about a, up about a half a percent um, of the U.S. population. And so are LGB and trans people underrepresented in the sciences? I have no idea. Are we marginalized in the sciences? Yes, right? We're marginalized in society in general, and the sciences aren't like some magical safe haven. Uh, I'm, I want to be really quick um, so we can transition to panel stuff. And so I, I really wanted to focus on this idea of um, how we use sort of our technical identities to unintentionally marginalize LGB and, and trans people. and. So there's this idea that I want to throw out there, which is this technical social dualism. And we heard a little bit about it when Sandra was talking about our schemas, right, for uh, male and female, like who's technical and who's social, who is really good at math and who's really good at caring for children. So the technical social dualism is the idea that technical things are different from social things. And technical things are better than social things. The, the dualism is bullshit, right? But it but it's exists. It's an important schema. It's an ideology that we use to understand the world. Um, and it intersects in problematic ways with our ideas about male-female binary, right? Men are seen as more technically proficient. Women as more socially proficient. And also with our ideas about race, right? White and Asian people are seen as more technical. Latin people are seen as more social or more uh, uh, socially competent. And this is reinforced through media, not just at our workplace, right? The Big Bang Theory has a lot of people whose technical proficiency comes at the expense of, say, social proficiency. Um, how does this interact with LGB identities um, and trans identities? Uh, when you start thinking about um, the stereotype of what, say, a gay man looks like, or an effeminate gay man, what happens is, as a gay man, as a gay man occupying a scientific space, Right, if I present as feminine or effeminate, that sort of dings me on my technical proficiency. Right, that dings me as uh, someone who is seen or expected to be good at physics. And so there becomes a social pressure now at work for me to pass and cover and to come off as masculine. And I can tell you in my personal experience, throughout high school and college, I, I practiced not coming off as queenie. Right? Like, I practice being masculine really deliberately. And I think all of us actually practice that. But not, of, not all of us do it very deliberately. Um, the last thing I want to say about this is that the, the pressure to pass and cover is really similar to uh, pressures that people feel who have, uh, who have other invisible dimensions of marginalization. And so this passing and covering is not actually unique to LGB people. Um, or trans people, but it, it's a broader issue, but it is something that LGB and, and trans people face. <clears throat> um, before we transition to the panel, I also want to give you some ideas of, of things we can do, right? And one of the things is be really careful about our language. So as technical people, we have male and female connectors, right? We talk about male and female connectors a lot. If you look at the research on LGB uh, engineering students, um, the idea that male and female connectors connect and then you get power or you get current flow, right, is actually something that students use to marginalize each other and to say, like, hey, look, male and or female and female connectors, you can't get any current flow. This is a wrong type of connection. In physics, right, we talk a lot about opposites attract. The word attract is really problematic, whatever, but uh, so you have this idea that opposites attract. 
and it gets translated into social contacts, right, to reinforce heteronormative um, ideas about what kinds of relationships are okay. But actually, even in physics, that idea doesn't make sense, right? So opposite charges attract, but like gravitational charges uh, attract. <laughs> And when you talk, start talking about quantum stuff, right, the idea that you have opposite charges with color charges breaks down because you have three color charges. So there are ways that we can start talking about, um, we can start using our technical language around binary things and attractive things that translate into uh, the social space in problematic ways a little bit differently. Similarly, right, getting out of the technical, just how we start talking to each other and how we start talking about each other in, in different interpersonal ways I think is really important. Um, so are you assuming that somebody has an opposite sex partner? Are you assuming that somebody has a traditional family? Um, if you're somebody who's in charge of, say, uh, forms, right, are you asking people to fill in just male and female bubbles? If you're somebody who's mentoring a student who's changing their first name because they're undergoing a gender transition, um, are you supporting them in navigating the institutional red tape around changing names and all the issues that come with legal name changes versus changing your preferred name? Uh, so I just wanted to toss out a bunch of those different ideas, technical social dualism, how we use technical language in the lab and around each other, how we interact interpersonally, some of the institutional barriers that are out there. Um, and I think now I'll just transition to the panel. So we've heard a huge amount of information. <laughs> um, so I guess it, there's, there are so many different ways in which we can take this discussion, but I really want to hear from you about your thoughts for, you know, what comes up for you for diversity, and do you have certain questions about, about diversity in general, about accommodating people, about how to create welcoming spaces? You know, what are your thoughts, what are your questions, and, and, and how can we take the discussion in a way that's useful for you? Somebody be brave. Yes. <laughs> you were. Uh, thanks. Hello, I'm Kiana Frank from University of Hawaii. So I fall in the other bubble. Um, and I just want to make a comment that it's very cultural specific. And um, I mentioned earlier that I often feel like I'm in between two worlds, but I think it's very rare that I'm also ostracized by my community for choosing this profession because science is seen as not Hawaiian. And so I get a lot of kickback from my community and I get a lot of kickback from the science community because of my race and my cultural identity. And so I think, um, at least at the University of Hawaii, Hawaiians are 25% of our population on the islands and they make up 14% of the undergrads, less than 1% of that is in the sciences, and there are three Native Hawaiian faculty in the natural sciences. And so I feel like they always go, they're like, oh, we need to increase diversity in STEM, we need to bring in more minorities, we need to bring in Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, but they're not really, they're creating new programs which are fabulous, but they're not addressing the issue. The issue is that the community thinks of science as not Hawaiian. And so I just want to bring up, bring up the point that like, it's not just about addressing the issues within science, science in general. It's also about bridging that gap to the community that you're interested in targeting and, and making it OK within that community to pursue this profession as well. Thank you. So I had a question for, I guess it would be Mike and Sandra, really for any of you though, so that you, a lot of folks were talking about just how important it is to create an inclusive climate um, in, in your workspace and on campus and everything. But um, could you give some sort of some concrete suggestions or examples or things that you think, actions that you think should be taken to create an inclusive climate? So, so I'm very interested in doing that, but um, I heard a lot of kind of more general and abstract things during the talks. This feels weird. Can I just talk? Can you hear me? Or do I need the mic? Oh, OK. Um, oh, you're right. Multiple modalities. Um, that's such a multifaceted question that I'll, I'll try to zone in on like one or two specific things. 
Yeah. Um, and so there are a lot of different ways to think about diversity. Um, there are a lot of w different ways to think about creating a, an inclusive environment. Um, a lot of the most important things for you as somebody who's looked to as a leader, um, as you assume postdoctoral positions, as you assume faculty positions, as you move forward, um, is being in touch with your own humanity, like having a good sense of who you are, what you can do and what you can't do, and looking for the appropriate support. You know, so I don't expect anybody to be an expert on dealing with the cultural issues across groups. So the previous commentary about Hawaiian culture, you know, something I'm very familiar with, you know, when multiple identities intersect and, you know, oh, my family doesn't care about me getting a graduate degree. They care about me living close to home and taking care of our elders um, and having children, for example, um, which are some of the cultural issues that you come in touch with. It's really about being open, um, realizing that there's shared humanity, that we all have families that we have to navigate, that we all have um, issues in the environment that we have to think about, um, and giving people space by open and clear communication, um, and also by kind of demonstrating the way, demonstrating that you care, demonstrating that you want to make space for people, um, and so engaging the people that you work with in conversations about difference. Um, giving people an opportunity. So if you have students with disabilities, if you have students um, who identify as LGBTQ, um, giving them the space to be themselves. You know, something as simple as asking at the beginning of class, which is something I do every semester, and I didn't even think about it as a inclusive practice until we were actually having a conversation as panelists, is I always go through my role list and, you know, what's your name, what's your preferred name? Like, here's what's on the list, here's what's on the roster, what would you like me to call you? Um, you know, like little simple strategies like that open the door and they start the conversation and they give people an opportunity to decide their identity, you know, decide the way that they want to engage. It gives you an opportunity to meet them where they're at and offer the resources. Um, I'd say an, another really important piece of that is just being yourself, you know. Um, share that you're not perfect, that it took you a long time, that it was difficult for you to get where you got, um, but that you had people that supported you and that helped you. And offer yourself as a person that will do that same type of work for the students and faculty members and colleagues that you come across. Um, because the only way that we can really change our environments is through the, the individual interactions that we have. You know, um, you know the difference between um, somebody who walks into the room and everybody lights up because they're excited to see them and somebody who walks in the room and everybody gets quiet and kind of looks away because they're not so excited to see them. Um, and like actively working to be the former rather than the latter. You know, that's another like concrete takeaway. Think about, you know, what, what helped me? What helped me persist? What helped me be resilient? What brightened my day? What made me think I can do this? Um, and making sure that you embody that positivity as much as possible. Um, just, just about something to there, you know, I, I really like the fact that you talk about um, preferred names. I think the one thing that trans students have told us is that they are terrified before that first day of class that they're going to be misgendered and that they're going to they're be outed to everybody in that class. So I'd actually strongly encourage you all before your first class to email your entire class. You've got their list of names there on the roster. That may not be their preferred name. So email your class before that first day of class and ask them over email what they want to be called and make sure you get it right. Because that way they know that they're not coming to that first day of class terrified that they're going to be outed or misgendered um, and, and they know that you're a safe space. And I would also also in your first you know class mention your preferred gender, uh, preferred gender pronoun so my preferred gender pronouns are she her and hers and that's just a way of opening up hi you know my name is dr carolyn brinkworth my preferred gender pronouns are she her hers um you know feel free to share yours or not as you see fit you, are, you don't need to out yourself so um, that's another way that you can go about that <laughs> i think language is a huge part of uh, climate that being attentive, that you don't um, use examples in your teaching or in your talking to colleagues or whatever that um, talk about wives, you can talk about spouses, you can talk about partners. Um, it, it's a habit change that you have to make, um, but it's one that you can work on. I think um, inclusive um, language around family structures, parenting, um, and, and inclusive practices, you know, being attentive to uh, maybe that meeting at the end of the day is not good for people who have to do the childcare run, but also being attentive to maybe the single person is not always the one who has to come back for the nighttime student, uh, you know, geo club meeting, right? That, that being attentive to the ways people arrange their lives um, may be different and trying to think about those spots where 
you can. I think that has a lot to do with climate. And little signals like that mean a lot to people, right? So it goes a long way. Um, I think um, uh, inclusion in decision making, if you are you know, part of a group, um, inclusion, inviting people to weigh in, um, just thinking about who's there. Um, this can also have to do with just, you know, not just the types of groups we've talked about, but you know, uh, if you're on the curriculum committee for your, your department, an academic department, um, are there non-tenure track faculty who should be included because they do a lot of that teaching, right? That's a status difference in academia that but that those people may have a lot to say. The undergraduate advisor may have a lot to say about those things. So thinking broadly about who knows about this issue and should be included in the conversation and decision making is important. And again, sends a big signal to people. Um, and you, you win a lot of friends that way, right? I mean, that, now you have that person on your side and they will help you. Um, and that, that goes for hiring decisions if you're in a company and, or in a national lab, you know, that these kinds of things being attentive to the, the um, assumptions that um, we might make about people and trying to catch your language. So I think that's a big piece of climate. That, as, as Michael said, the everyday interactions um, and, and just watching out for these things. Um, and, and, and things like, this is something I've become sensitized to recently. Um, I have a good friend who has a pretty substantial hearing loss and I have been oblivious through much of my life until recently to how noisy restaurants are, right? And so now I've started making a practice of checking out restaurants before I make a, you know, a, a date to have dinner with her so that I'm choosing a quieter place and I'm not putting all the load on her um, to, to be listening in a noisy environment. And that's just an awareness I've come to only recently, but it, it, and it turns out to be a more pleasant dinner too, right? <laughs> if we're not in such a noisy place. So it's a constant, um, self-awareness practice, I think. Or does Chris want to say anything? Uh, I, I would agree. I think language is the biggest, uh, is a big one. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, it's making sure that, you know, a lot of times it's it's you that have, that you have to be the one to do the legwork on it and, and to establish a, an inclusive culture and inclusive community. Um, uh, person first language if you're you're, you're dealing with uh, individuals with disabilities is a big one uh, it's it's a cultural issue um, I think it's becoming more prevalent person first language is becoming more prevalent in the United States if you go over to uh, to to Europe and England and, and France uh, it's not so much uh, of a big deal to say uh, uh, that this this disabled individual um, which um, it is more of an issue for us, but it's just uh, more of a respect issue to, to realize that they're not identifying as, uh, they're not identifying with their disability, they're not identifying um, with their sexual preference or sexual orientation, they're not identifying with their race, with their gender, they're identifying as the individual, and I think it's, it's necessary to make sure that, that you realize that, that you practice what you're teaching with your students and with your faculty colleagues as well, that it's going to take time, but through language and through cultural development, that that's, that, that inclusive practice is going to start to take hold. It's not, it's not going to happen overnight, just understand that. Um, and so and thinking a little bit about like visibility yeah. issues, uh, just coming from the uh, the perspective of someone who passes us straight in a lot of contexts. Uh, it can be really hard um, to be, so I think connecting students with role models is an important thing. Um, and I think for a lot of um, queer faculty or queer teaching assistants or whatever, it's hard, right? There's this decision, do I come out to my students and if I do, how? Um, and how can I be a good role model? And so one of the things that we can do um, as uh, straight allies or people who aren't comfortable coming out, right? Because not everybody, that's not a responsibility. I don't have a responsibility to be out to my students. Um, but one of the things that we can do is elevate visibility. So some things like, uh, I'm gonna be speaking now from a very physics background, because that's where I'm coming from, but the physics community has a website, lgbtphysicist.org, and that has a list, it has an out list where students can go to see, hey, are there any out uh, queer physicists at my institution. It also has an ally list, right? Are there any people at my institution who are on the ally list? And so making students aware of that resource, um, or others like it maybe, I, I don't know if there are similar resources in other spaces, but I imagine that there are. I, I know that APS has lists of 
uh, minority speakers, right, if you want to invite minority speakers. But making people aware of those, making your students aware of those types of resources so they can go seek people who are out um, uh, is, an, is an important thing. And there are also like features, right, so like APS released um, uh, sort of a feature of a bunch of different queer physicists, which was pretty cool. So you can forward that to your department or students or something like that. As you're talking, Dimitri, I'm thinking about another element of climate, which is physical space. When I do, I do a lot of work on other campuses, and when I walk around, I look at whose picture is on the walls, and what kind of things are portrayed, and does it look like a place where there's stuff going on that I would want to do, or are there, a, you know, a bunch of um, old fuddy-duddy looking um, people, you know, <laughs> on the walls? I mean, I, you notice these things, right? The, the welcoming, the, are there places to sit and hang out and have a chat after class? And, and um, are, there, are there people doing things, or does it look dead and quiet? And so it's something to be attentive to um, in sort of what might the spaces be communicating. And again, there's research about this that um, shows that differences in the, in the physical um, environment also communicate things about what your workplace is like, what your department is like. Um, and it's worth noticing those things and thinking about what messages they send. So we've got Hi. time for one more question, and then we're going to have to let you head out for the bus. Great. Um, so I was, uh, Sandra, you showed a figure that I was really interested to see, which was the time lag, time shifted, undergraduate, graduate, postdoc, assistant professor, associate full professor plot. And um, it really made me think of, of all the discussions I've heard about specifically getting more women into faculty positions or more women to get farther in science. I often feel like the places that they are trying to solve the problem are not actually where the problem exists. And I think that plot really shows that there's no problem converting undergraduates to PhD. It's basically you're getting a direct, however many percent undergrad women you have, that's how many you get in PhD. And postdoc was pretty good too, and then you see this big fall off. But even in undergraduate, it's only 30% or something, 35%. So there's kind of two different problems then. It's one, getting women to be undergraduate science majors, and then second, to get them from postdoc to faculty. And the in-between transition seems to be working okay. So I would love to hear your opinion, and this does apply to all the different groups of how can the research on these things help focus how we try to solve the problem because it's not recruiting more female graduate students. That's not going to make more female professors because that's not where the fall off is happening. Um, so, I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on. It's, it's a great question because that, that, um, that is true for the geosciences in general, that um, the percentage of women uh, going into graduate school and getting PhDs is, is quite comparable to the percentage of women getting the undergraduate degree. It's a little tricky for geo because a lot of you, as you, a lot of you know, you didn't come from an undergraduate geo degree, right? There are physicists and chemists and biologists and uh, all kinds of things, engineers who go into, into geosciences later. It's also variable by different subfields. I didn't show that, but you know, oceanography looks different than atmospheric science. Um, so, but, but your point is well taken in that, and, and it also differs by disciplines, right? It looks different for physics than it does for chemistry than it does for geo. <clears throat> so that's a really interesting research question. I would call that a sort of cutting edge question right now. What are these disciplinary differences? We need to unpack them and understand them um, across STEM disciplines as well as unpacking across, you know, as Michael mentioned, for instance, lumping all Asian Americans together, you know, disserves some groups um, and not understanding. So I think that's a, a real hot research area right now is un unlumping. <laughs> But it does also speak to the issue that the postdoc is a key transition time and also a hot area of research. We don't know enough about what the barriers are. We, we do know some issues about um, <clears throat> uh, you know, things like benefits um, and um, leave issues. You know, this is a time when people are often at an age where they're starting a family and um, 
it's this is kind of you know probably the crappiest benefits you'll ever have are right now on your postdoc um, unless you have a nice posh one which may be true for a lot of you but but in general postdocs do not get good family leave benefits and health benefits and things that um, might support starting a family there's also that worry about the job transition and so on and people are making big life decisions there about what kind of career path they're going to go into um, and so there's a lot going on in that uh, it's a sensitive time and there are disciplinary differences that tell us um, you know there's some interesting things happening there but we don't know all of what they are um, certainly um, you know, in the life sciences, um, similar to the net numbers for GEO, uh, lots of women are getting PhDs, and then the postdoc period is a place where it really crashes, and the proportion of women is quite a bit lower. And there, we think part of what's going on is uh, the culture of needing multiple postdocs in the life sciences before you can get a faculty job. So it's just really a long haul, and people just are like, you know, forget it. I want to get on with my life. I want to finally make some money. You know, <laughs> I know when I was a when I took a postdoc, uh, my mother was like, "Postdoc? You're not done? I thought the doc was enough." I said, "No, mom. This one has health benefits." Oh, well, then it's almost a real job. <laughs> you know? But it's a long time, right? It's a long schlep, and that's certainly part of the issue for people as they want to get on with it. So there are interesting questions there. Um, and the other thing I, I should point out in that figure that you're mentioning is that. You know, the people in the bottom, the bottom dots, where there are much smaller representation of women, are the ones making the decisions and teaching the courses and, and admitting the students who are coming in. And so cultural change, you know, part of that is just a time lag of who, who is old enough to be a professor, a full professor, but part of it is also who's controlling the decision making. So there's a lot going on there. There's a mix of personal choice and also constraints, right? Do we feel fully free to pursue what we want to choose or do we feel constrained by society? And um, it's an important issue, and, and one that the research um, hasn't fully unpacked yet. Um, I, I want to touch on that a little bit, because that graphic isn't unusual across disciplines. And that fall off, even in fields that don't have postdocs, like the move from PhD to assistant professor to associate professor to full professor, it looks pretty similar. Um, Kimberly Griffin is a researcher who you'd probably be interested in her work. I um, started to unpack this in some of the broad sciences, um, in chemistry and biology and computer science. Um, and some of the outcomes and some of the reasons that they've started to point to, um, you know, yeah, some of it is the slog, some of it is the time to degree. Um, each additional year to degree decreases the likelihood that somebody's gonna pursue a faculty career. Um, some of it is the money. So a lot of the hard sciences, it's much more lucrative for you to go and work in industry than it is for you to go and take a huge pay cut in academia. Um, and so people, because they've spent so much time, because they've invested so much in terms of their earning power in school, um, they're not willing to sacrifice in terms of salary when they get out. Um, and some of it is a lot of what we've been talking about, just the discrimination, the problems and discrimination across all fields. Um, women are much less likely to have their academic journal articles cited. Um, women are much, much less likely to be called as experts and be op-eds. You know, there are mul multiple, numerous studies across fields showing that these huge disparities in like who's considered an expert um, is difficult. And so if you write a journal article and a man writes a journal article and it's a sim like similarly placed, but this person has 5,000 citations and you have four, um, it, it becomes a difficulty where the, the work is being undervalued um, and that lack of value leads people to either exit or they get the suggestion that they should exit because they're not productive enough um, or they're not doing the things, they're not um, living up to whatever the standard is um, in the field. And so like there are a lot of researchers who are kind of working on that type of stuff. Um, Susan Gardner at the University of Maine does that type of work. Um, at UMass Amherst, uh, what is her name? Um, Benita Barnes does that type of work. Um, Kimberly Griffin at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, at Michigan State University, um, Melissa McDaniels does that type of work. And they're really starting to look across fields at, you know, why are people exiting? And like, why can't we have this critical mass? Why can't we push um, the number of full professors, people who are in decision-making capacities up?
All right, so we're going to have to break. Um, one thing I do want to let you know, concrete recommendations. There was a, um, a conference organized um, over the summer, which is called Inclusive Astronomy. It was the first of its kind organized over the, over the summer, which didn't look specifically at one type of minority or underrepresented group in astronomy. It looked intersectionally at all of them. So it looked at race, it looked at gender identity, sexual orientation, disabilities, um, size issues, socioeconomic status, you name it. Um, they have just released um, a 36-page document of recommendations that came out of that um, conference. So I would highly recommend that you go and take a look at that. If you can't find it online, I know they're in a, a public um, uh, comment um, a session right now. So if you can't find it, please email me. I'll be more than happy to send you that link. And you're more than welcome to go and comment on that link and make suggestions yourself about how to make science more inclusive. But it's not only astronomy-centric. It also has a huge number of recommendations um, across all the sciences. So I would highly, highly encourage you to go and look at that because it contains all of the concrete recommendations that an entire group of 150 people could come up with, which was a lot. So. Um, in conclusion, I would like to say thank you so much to the panel. Thank you, Chris, for calling in from all the way over there. If any of you would like to talk further about this, um, I've done a lot of work on this. I'd be happy to talk to you tomorrow. Um, but thank you all very much indeed. Uh, your bus will be waiting for you outside, and we will see you all at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning.